but looking forward to a great conversation. So again, my name is Brad Vogel. I'm the executive director of the New York Preservation Archive Project. And what are we all about? We are really looking at how have some of the great neighborhoods and landmarks of the city been preserved? How do they still exist today despite all the things in, in New York that might lead to a building getting demolished or altered or changed in a way where you can't tell that historic story any longer? So I'm really excited because we have two people who have different lenses on Clay Avenue. And I'm also excited because I can tell that we have some people on the Zoom tonight who either live on Clay Avenue, who know Clay Avenue very well, um, or have worked as a consultant on projects on Clay Avenue in the historic preservation space. So lots of good stuff um, is in store. But first, before we get into things, I do think that we should do a little toast to the Bronx and to Clay Avenue. So I hope you all join me in saying cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. Well, let me give you the, the and actually I want to mention one thing also, um, because I know Dondi you're on and I think we have some other folks on here this evening um, who are either part of or supporters of Historic Districts Council. And Historic Districts Council, as many of you know, is celebrating its 50th anniversary of advocacy around the city this year, which is fantastic. And I see students and clapping there, even if we can't hear you, uh, <laughs> I, can, I can hear it in, in my mind's eye. So thank you to HDC because HDC has done a great deal of on the ground outreach with uh, the residents of Clay Avenue. And actually that's part of why Chuck Kovanek is here with us tonight, having worked on the Six to Celebrate campaign with HDC. So this little button is for HDC and your efforts to lift up Clay Avenue. And I want to specifically thank Diego Robayo, who has been doing a lot of work in the Bronx and journalism um, on behalf of HDC and really building those connections with people in the neighborhood. So looking forward to hearing from some of you later. Right now, I'm going to introduce our Bronx resident speaking tonight, who is a a board member for the New York Preservation Archive Project. Um, and he's a lot of other things, Paul Onyx Lozito. So Paul, thank you for being here tonight. Um, Paul is a graduate of the Hunter Urban Planning Master's Program. Um, he works for the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. And he's a Bronx Community Board 8 member, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, board 4, but my, doesn't oh, matter. My bad, my bad. <laughs> I'm doubling you up. Um, he also lives on the Grand Concourse in the historic district there that is not that far from Clay Avenue. Um, and perhaps most importantly these days, he has two cats, Monique and Silhouetto. Oh, and there's Silhouetto. <laughs> Very good to see that he made the show tonight. Um, and our other speaker this evening is Chuck Hovanek. Now Chuck, does not live in the Bronx. He lives in Queens, um, in this neighborhood. You went to Fordham, though. So does that went to Fordham, so we've got a yeah. Bronx tie. <laughs> but Chuck is currently the Deputy Director of Resilience and Affordable Housing at the New York State Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. So it seems to me that you possibly even work with Paul, Chuck. Is that the case? Just a coincidence. OK, just a coincidence. Yeah. He graduated from Columbia's Historic Preservation Program, where he focused his research on the impacts of Sandy on historic communities along the Jersey Shore. And he first encountered Clay Avenue while surveying the area for the HDC Six to Celebrate guidebook. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you to talk a little bit about Clay Avenue. Um, wonderful, thank you, Brad. Uh, I'll, I think I'll give a little bit of like back back story um, my background, I'm a historic preservation advocate, but I really am into history and Chuck is a trained historic preservationist, so he can do a little bit more of the nuance and the detail. Um, you know, because there's a large number of people from a wide variety of backgrounds, I thought it might be interesting to talk about why just in general the area is important in New York City history. Um, so one interesting thing that you, what is interesting about Clay Avenue is it's a quintessential New York City block. It's a beautiful and important block, but it's a quintessential New York City block. 
So what I mean by that is New York City was settled in the 1600s, as we all know, right, by the Dutch. And Clay Avenue was part of a land that was say, uh, surveyed by a gentleman named Johannes Bronx for the Dutch, East, the Dutch West India Company, sorry. Um, he then sold the lands to a gentleman named Lewis Morris, who established an estate called Morrisania, which is the name of the neighborhood today. Um, Lewis Morris uh, and his family were um, very notable in American history. Um, Lewis Morris's son was the governors of both New York and New Jersey at the same time when that was possible. Um, and his great-grandson, Lewis Morris IV, was uh, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and actually proposed Morrisania to be a, um, a, the capital of the United States. And so, you know, under different circumstances, Clay Avenue might actually be a, um, a, a hallway between the Senate and the House, but that is not what happened. Instead, it's a beautiful block. Um, what the Morris family estate looked like in the 1700s, sorry, I have a brand new kitten, it needs my attention. Um, what the Morris estate looked like in the 1700s was basically like Downton Abbey, if anyone's seen that show. Um, there were a number of different uh, farms, um, cattle farms, uh, fields, um, um, dairies, and uh, they had a lot of, um, some indentured and some free sharecroppers who, who farmed. Uh, on the estate. Um, in the late 1700s, they became more enterprising and um, specifically uh, Governor Morris, who was the son of Louis Morris IV, signed the declaration. Um, he actually was very instrumental in the New York City, um, the New York City street grid plan. And so he had in mind's eye towards development and he approached his estate that way. He brought the New York and Harlem Railroad, and to this day, there is a, um, a Metro North uh, stop two blocks or three blocks from Clay Avenue, maybe a little bit more. Um, and they started to subdivide up the state of the estate in the late 1800s. Um, immediately prior to being developed, Clay Avenue was a, uh, called the Fleetwood Trotting Field, so it was where they uh, trotted horses uh, before it was sold off. Um, and you know, what, it, what's also important is that it was one, it was basically the New York City model that we were going for in the late 1800s and 1900s. The Bronx became part of New York City in 1898. Part of that was because of the services that were coming to, uh, the area. One of them being the Third Avenue elevated train, uh, water and sewer. And that was supposed to motivate high quality development that was advocated by the German and Irish that lived in the area at the time. And so I'll just turn it over to Chuck to talk more about the specific development of Clay Avenue uh, around uh, 1900. Sorry, I'll mute. Um, <laughs> hi all. Uh, yeah, so I want to preface this by saying that I'm not, uh, you know, a, an expert on Clay Avenue. I'm not a resident, um, but I, one of my, re one of the reasons why I liked Clay Avenue a lot and is one of the reasons why I got into historic preservation and got such an interest in New York's communities. I think that anybody that lives in New York or a historic community for that matter, like has a block that they think is really gorgeous. that they like enjoy walking down um, and like, just think, you know, this is like worthy of something. I know that there's some in Sunnyside where I live now um, and every neighborhood that I lived in the city, I've found that to be true. And so I think Clay Avenue is interesting because it's just like a really uh, intact and beautiful block um, that happened to have a story around people that wanted to advocate to save that. And so I think that this call today will be really interesting later on um, to talk about the people that might be, that might have been involved in the, the process of, you know, providing a city level protection as a historic district. Um, so when I give you kind of an overview of the neighborhood, I'm coming from a person that was hired by Historic Districts Council to document it and who thinks it's really beautiful, but if I like, you know, don't know any of the inside stories, I'm hoping somebody else covers that ground. Um, right, right, right. And, and, and yeah, as, as, as Chuck is making clear, and as I mentioned earlier, we're definitely here to learn tonight, not just to present you some information. And if you have something that you know that is helpful about this neighborhood or about a specific building, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll be going through the chat and sort of lifting up some of these items for questions and we might even unmute some folks later on and then we'll have a full-on Q&A at the end. So just, just so you're aware of that. 
before Chuck gets into it. So, um, yeah, I kind of like, you know, sorry, unmuted, um, but because it's so nice out, uh, I want to uh, kind of walk down the street like we all wish we could be doing right now, kind of discuss like what, what Clay Avenue kind of feels like and looks like, um, while also giving like a bit of historic context. So um, if you want to pull up a map of where Clay Avenue is, Brad, um, it's in the Bronx, obviously, on Clay Avenue between 165th and 166th Streets. So it's in red right there. Everything that's pink is an individually designated landmark. Everything that's yellow is a historic district. Um, so you can see not only is there um, kind of like a paucity of, of protected places in the Bronx, um, Clay Avenue is relatively small. Uh, this is a screenshot, so it's kind of hard to zoom in, but um, it's, it's literally a block long of like 28 uh, semi-attached or attached uh, basically row houses with on the four corners that front the numbered streets there's three apartment buildings and uh, uh, like a standalone mansion and so the way this was built like Paul alluded to was a developer named Ernest Winigman um, bought this parcel of land and wanted to divide it for you know speculative residential housing like most a lot of neighborhoods in New York uh, what I think is is interesting not only because this neighborhood's intact but is kind of the uh, the the aspirational sense that this community had these houses are uh designed to look like pairs of single family units but they're actually subdivided so that each pair or each half of the pair can house two um, families so you know uh an aspirational middle class homeowner that uh yeah. wanted to buy a house can still rent out the other unit to another family so supplement his income to afford the house and so right. This so Chuck, is, let me let me pull up some yeah, please. of that just so that we can show folks what you're talking about. When you walk down the block, you kind of it feels like you're just looking at um, like it's very cohesive um, in each unit. But yeah, when you pull it up, Brad, and it, and it's really interesting because like the census records are included in the designation report that was written for this district, um, and it kind of paints a picture of like who was living there at the time. Um, and, you know, at the time it was entirely white. It was mostly American um, or people that identified as American because um, the census asked what your nationality is. And they would also ask, I think, your parents' uh, nationality. So there was a lot of people who had uh, immigrants, um, who had parents that were immigrants. But this was kind of like aspirational middle class uh, territory. And the, the careers of the people that occupy it are kind of reflected. Um, and what are we talking in terms of the development? Because Paul presented us with this sort of bucolic iteration of the Bronx, which I think a lot of people tend to forget today um, that the Bronx once one, Bronx was this sort of scenic country landscape at one time. And obviously, the, the buildings from the designation report in the early 90s, this district is, you know, fully built up and all built within a relatively short time span, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, uh, I believe the block was like fully built out by 1905, um, or 1905 was uh, when the census was, was uh, documented. So they were all built within a single period of time at the um, turn of the century. I'm just blanking on the, the exact date at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, and I think between, but, but, but roughly between 1900 and 1905, everything on the block that exists today was built during that window, right? Yes. Okay. Um, people were purchasing it on the side streets. I believe that um, some of the apartment houses were built a bit later in like 1906 or something. But I, the, the neighborhood was like fully built out by that point. Yeah, I think what it was was that we had like three sort of waves, right? So we had most of the buildings were built between 1901 and 1905. And that's why the census records sort of corroborate that some of the houses were rentals while they were trying to sell them. And then they had two apartment buildings that were built um, later on towards 19, oh, actually one single family home and an apartment building that were built in 1909 and 1910 and that completed the block. Got it. Okay, I'm just gonna go through some of these images and feel free to note anything that you want to about these as we go. So what I kind of wanted to get at at a higher level of the way the architect designed the neighborhood besides it, you know, trying to create this image of a single family unit is that where a lot of um, row house communities uh, 
and I'm from Philly and I say row houses or row homes, but uh, I'm from the Philly area, so that's what we say. But I think they're, you know, I don't know what to call these necessarily, but uh, they're, you know, attached or semi-detached houses. And a lot of the blocks in New York are fairly um, repetitive. Um, and, and then here, the architect, uh, Warren Dickerson, uh, basically uh, made, the, made it asymmetrical, but patterned. So if you look at a pair of houses, Brad, you can pull up, you know, I think 1052, uh, Clay Avenue is a good example. Okay. You can see like the north and the south units have different um, materials. It's like a beige brick versus a red brick. Uh, and like it, they, they don't look like a married pair. But then if you walk down the block to like 1050, uh, 1056, 1058 Clay Avenue, you can see that 1058, the northern unit, matches 1054 of the southern unit. Um, this would be easier. Uh, <laughs> With uh, just a, with a kind of visual, but so he he Wait, really interplayed. Are you like, not? Is it, are you not seeing any visuals? I'm seeing the map right now. Oh, you have not seen any of the photos that have got, been I've been posting. No. Uh, okay. But, Good to know. Let me try to get that operating. I'm sorry. No worries. So <laughs> happy. <laughs> Maybe that's why I was like, okay, <laughs> going to keep talking. Mm -hmm. So you were saying, Chuck? Yeah. yeah, so what I was saying was that um, you can really sense as you walk down the block, it'll, you'll see like th the massing and the materials repeated. And, um, you know, there's different like kind of, there's like a, like an open air, almost like turret at the top of one building that is, is very, it's like gorgeous. And then you'll see it and it won't uh, be mirrored on the Southern half. But then if you go down and walk down um, to the next building, it'll be on the Northern half. So. I think it makes like a very interesting like streetscape to kind of walk down and encounter. It doesn't feel uh, boring. It feels engaging. Um, here we go. So, are you seeing anything at this point? Chuck? Yeah, we're seeing yeah. it now. We're so seeing that's, the, that's awesome. the, the photos. Sorry. I'm doing exactly what I did before. So, cool. Not sure what was happening. Apologies, but let's get you to some images. Here we go. Yeah. So. Well, this one actually, you, this one is relatively similar in, in its materials, right? You can see this kind of like rough stone um, around the door frames on both 1042 and 1044, and then, you know, the brick on the rest of the facade. So, yeah. Um, right. The thing that struck me about the houses is the, there's a sense of unity, and yet there's also a great deal of variety and variation and it's in seemingly an intentional effort to make for variation. So yeah, the heavy rustication around the doors um, and the coins that you see, there's actually detailing here with stone around the doorways and the rounded bays coming out. Um, and we have dormers. We have, here's the rustication with the rough hewn stone. You have- like patios or, you, or open air spaces up here. Even if you like zoom in on that one a bit, you can see how those, the, the two houses closest um, in the last photo are uh, not similar to the ones next to it, but then further down, you'll see some of the detailing repeated on another house. So it's kind of, it, like I had been saying earlier, it kind of just creates this, this dynamism that I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I like the fact that they have, it's like very quintessentially Romanesque, right? So they have recessed windows, they have, you know, gabled wall dormers, they have, um, what else do they have? Let's just pick it yeah, out. I mean, um, the other thing that forth. struck me too is you have Flemish revival, sort of the swooping gable here. Right. Which, which is always interesting. And over here, you can see signs of the stepped gable. And I think we are approaching 1065 Clay Avenue, which I know we have some folks on the line this evening who may want to talk about that. So I'm going to step out of the share here for a moment and see if Mary Kay, Judy, and Ali are on the call here. One second. Yes, so Paul, if you want to unmute Mary Kay or Mary Kay, go right ahead. Oh, you know what? Um, yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with um, Ali Mozafari on 1065 
uh, for a couple of years and he might be a better person to tell the background, but I'm not sure if he's here. I think he is. I think you are. I, I just unmuted Ali. Oh, okay. Ali, I'm going to hand it over to you to give the background. Okay. Good evening. Hey! Good evening How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, is a Corona keep me in the house and now I, I grow beer, <laughs> beer here. <laughs> yeah. So Ali, do you want to talk about like how your family came to own the house and the work that you've been doing uh, for the past several years, your labor of love? Well, yeah, originally, as you know, that the, the house was burned about 40, 45 years ago and was neglected for the previous owner, what happened. And then I eventually, the, because of the taxes, this HPD took, took it over. And then uh, by default, we went to the auction and then uh, we, you know, my brother and my mom, they built in the house because from the, the front did not, uh, was no, the damage was not obvious. Was behind it, it was all, everything was burned down. Did you buy, did they buy it based just on photographs? Exactly. <laughs> based on the, exactly, they had a brochure that, you know, the picture looks beautiful because it was from outside, it's a landmark. So they thought that they have it, but, you know, once we went there and uh, we were to our surprise, we saw it's just the front and the back, you know, of course the wall was there, but inside all was damaged and burned out because this was all, everything was uh, wood all the best stuff. So, uh, so where is the project at today? Today, thanks to the help of Mary Kay, we are on the road <laughs> to building it. <laughs> Excellent. You know, in 19, I think 19, uh, oh, 1994, the, the house, you know, as a, you know, the block became a landmark since then, after we had to comply with the landmark rule. So by the time actually I had my hands on it, you know, that, you know, actually my wife had on it, it was 2012. So once we went there to figure out what has to be done because it was the uh, dump yard for the whole block, uh -oh. actually the whole area. Uh, so once we went there, you know, you touched the building. I brought the architect. They said they cannot get in because it was unsafe. So uh, to make it short, you know, we started doing it by the time we start moving the dirt about, I would say about 18, 40 yard container I took out of the, you know, the debris. But uh, once we take everything it out, uh, it's really, it came a big storm and then everything was open. So, and probably those dirt, they keep the house in, sh in place. You <laughs> <laughs> know, all those garbages. So the front, you know, uh, about two story of it collapsed. I see. And that's the problem we start with the landmarks. That was the problem <laughs> uh, that the landmark got involved, of course, but not that we didn't want to follow the landmark, but you know, after that, you know, that uh, you know, is the biggest story that, uh, you know, so we had to get involved and comply with the landmark rule, whatever it is. And, but it was not easy to do it because it was no access from any side that you can bring any mechanical tools or anything. Ah. So everything has to be by, two, by hands. I see, I so, see, that's quite the challenge, yes. And we couldn't touch the, the outside, so we had to, everything was bad shape. And uh, so we got involved with the architect. We came and look, you know. So we, uh, as of right now, we are rebuilding it. Uh, but I was hoping by the end of the summer, I can finish it up. Uh, but uh, this coronavirus has stopped everything. So I'm just idling up and see what's, what happened. I see. Now, Mary Kay, as a preservation consultant on this project, um, where did you turn for archival research to find out what this property had looked like before? Um, well, as, uh, 
as Chuck was saying earlier, that the houses are duplicates. So, you know, we could find, there is a match to 1065 on the block. And um, I should just fill out a little bit of the story from, from what Ali was talking about is that um, the Landmarks Commission came after 1065 Clay and was charging with demolition by neglect. Mm -hmm. So it kind of jump-started things. And the Conservancy, uh, the Landmarks Conservancy used to have a page on their website where it was like owners of shame, like they were shaming the owners that weren't taking care of their buildings. So um, 1065 had shown up on that also. But the Conservancy actually recommended me to Ali and Ali's family. And uh, when I first got involved, yes, like because Ali said it was just there. We go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just... so if you take a look behind me, <laughs> uh, here. Yeah, this is a, a sense of the the vacant windows behind me uh, for that property. Um, so the first thing that we needed to do was you're right. We needed to just do some archival research and create some documentation. Um, of course, I went to the tax photos, so, and those are really helpful. The, um, the designation photos were good. And we also found a book called, um, it was a brochure at Avery and it's called, uh, and you must know this, you're smiling. Um, it's called A Home for Nut Seekers or like a nut for home seekers to crack. And it was the promotional brochure for these houses. So it included floor plans and some details. And uh, Ali did something remarkable. I know you cleaned out all the debris, but you also salvaged everything that was historic, every brick, every piece of stone, all the pressed metal. So all of that was on site. Um, so we went back to Landmarks. We got um, the permit to move ahead. And actually just, just recently, we had to do one um, permit amendment because it's gonna be multiple apartments to put in the vents for the hot water heaters. So, but um, I'm happy to share the, the photos, but and yeah. Ali's family photos were also great, showing the damage when they arrived. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, please feel free to share if you do have them. Okay. Uh, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the multiple apartments because that's another aspect of this. As you read the designation report, you realize that there seemed to be a very conscious effort by the developer to make for a sort of social, socioeconomic variation across the block, even if it appeared to be a sort of unified linked whole. Um, so yeah, Paul, do you do you have any of the any of the stories for sort of how the houses were laid? Or Chuck, I forget which one of you was looking at that more closely. Yeah. So I mean, like, if you what I think was really interesting about the designation report, uh, which you know, Brad, you alluded to, was written by Andrew Dolcart, who was my professor at Columbia, like you can like take a look into some of the houses and then see like the stories of the people that were living inside and see how there were multiple unit um multiple units in the houses so if i pull up like 1055 or 1050 1052 clay avenue the report reads like the residents of 1050 were a carpet salesman mr hubbard his wife two sons a daughter and their danish servant and fireman thomas ahern and his daughter son and two sisters so within that one attached house, there was like one, two, three, four, five, six people in one household, which includes a, a Danish servant, and then a house, uh, a family of five on the, in the rental apartment. And in the uh, attached unit, there was uh, Mr. Henry Kabod, his mother, his daughter, an Irish-born aunt, and they're all recorded as living at that one house. So in that instance, it might have been just... Um, you know, there might not have always, it might not have always been subdivided, but I think uh, it depended on the time in which the census was taken, whether, you know, tenants were utilizing the other spaces or not. And every um, unit looks like that. So it's kind of cool to, to walk down the block and see um, and read about who lived there at that point. Uh, one more thing I'd know is that in the apartment buildings that like flank the block, um, which were designed by Neville and Badge who, uh, you know, designed a, a fair amount of apartment buildings in the city. Uh, they, the, the tenants there are, often have different occupations than those in the single family houses on the main block. So uh, you like take a look at the census data for that um, and you see 
nationalities, including American, Italian, and German. And like I had said previously, uh, the majority of the interior of the block was American-born families. So, you know, this apartment building might have been attracting people that were uh, either Italian or German-born or had recent uh, connections to those countries. And the occupations are for, if I'm looking at 360 East 166th Street, and in 1910, they had uh, a bookkeeper, a grocer, architect, photo engraver, asphalt company laborer, and court clerk all list, uh, listed under the census records there. So okay. it's kind of this like motley uh, assortment of people like a normal apartment in New York today, but um, yeah. reflective of the time. And it's like sort of a, uh, it's a New York story, right? So the story of the Bronx was that a lot of people moved to what was called the North Side at the time uh, from the crowded tenements in the Lower East Side. And what you had happen were instances where people who were considered in some way, shape, or form to be upwardly mobile, the kinds of people that Chuck described, had the opportunity to move to these neighborhoods. And in the case of Clay Avenue, which is really one of the first places in the Bronx to be settled, um, it was settled before the Grand Concourse was even constructed, you know, as an example. Mm -hmm. And it was a model that other, um, other neighborhoods followed in terms of the train came, the development happened, people came. Um, what you see in that situation is you see people who are laborers, accountants, people who are considered at the time and still to this day to be middle class moving to that neighborhood, um, regardless of their former ethnic or um, religious affiliations. You know, you had mm -hmm. Irish Catholics, uh, you had Italians and Jews all living together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, if, are you guys able to see this photo that's up presently? Great. Okay, so... I just want to pay attention again for a moment here as you're walking down this block, the level of detail that, and, and attention and craftsmanship that was put into these buildings is really remarkable to me. You have your sort of keystone scroll here. You have little bits of rusticated stone interspersed with regular stone that's finished. And you have bands of rusticated stone running across. You have these leaded transom windows here um, and you have a really ornate surround for the door with its own little overhanging cornice here and even some maybe arguably sort of art nouveau creeping in up here around the window so it's just it's really remarkable I think especially as you look at development in New York City today in terms of what architecture presents to the street so often today it's about what can this building get in terms of looking out at the street? And the buildings on Clay Avenue seem to be doing something and giving something in a sort of, the buildings themselves are almost a civic gift to the people walking down the street. And I just think that's a fascinating thing to, to remember and to think that these were, these were not necessarily being constructed for, you know, extraordinarily wealthy individuals it was for people of a variety of different means the other thing about the clay avenue historic district is that it's relatively small and i was wondering what the two of you thought that might mean with respect to the broader sense of of preservation in the bronx because um, as you noted chuck at the outset there are really not that many districts in the bronx for its size and those that do exist, I believe, are all relatively small. Yeah, I mean, um, to kind of start things off, like, and Brad, feel free to just like shuffle through the photos because there's so many pretty ones and I just like yeah. love looking at the buildings on this block. <laughs> but, um, uh, and you know, I for, for those of you with like less of a preservation background, like a lot of historic districts um, in other parts of the city are very like large swaths of a neighborhood like the village for instance um or even um you know or like the upper east side or something like that where multiple building typologies are encompassed within a single district but uh in a lot of areas and including in this in the bronx um anything that's kind of protected is a lot of the times is just um a single type of building so here it's just a row of these houses that look the same and then the apartment buildings or, or the and the one mansion flanking it um, and not really expanding beyond that. And when I did my surveying of the neighborhood, in fact, the 
Historic Districts Council asked me to go to the Grand Concourse um, that also, uh, and, and like document the buildings in between. So I think, you know, there's a lot of value beyond the, that single district, but I think that's just kind of the, the, the norm as to what you kind of expect in that outer boroughs or in the areas overlooked by, you know, the initial preservation movement. I don't know, Paul, if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I think the important characteristics, and I'm just ad living here, of a historic district are generally that the district is built in the same kind of time. And so when you have like a larger district like Greenwich Village or um, any, you know, Prospect Heights or, or wherever you are, um, it's generally built around the same time. So what you have with Clay Avenue is in fact that it's built at basically the same time by the same architect. Um, and that's what sort of contributes to the fact that that block is unique among other blocks and is worth preserving. Um, one interesting thing I think is important to mention about Clay Avenue is that the architect was Warren C. Dickerson, and he is an architect also designed this, uh, buildings in the uh, Longwood district, uh, which is also a small historic district in uh, more east of uh, Clay Avenue in the Bronx. Um, and I think he also may have designed some homes in the Morris High School section as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to see some of these smaller districts that are not contiguous, built around the same time by the same architect in the same style. Um, it speaks to the quality of the work um, and it speaks to the fact that the quality of the work and the people who cared about those districts galvanized themselves together to make sure that they preserve these really remarkable, um, in this case, Romanesque, and I think in the case of Longwood Romanesque uh, structures. Okay. Now we have a good question here from Susan DeVries. And Susan, if you'd like to unmute and ask that question, I think it's a great one. Paul, do you want to unmute her just to be sure? In the meantime, I'll ask the question. In the okay, no, nope, I'm oh, here now. Thanks. Oh, great. <laughs> um, I was just um, curious about the early years. So they're, are they finished about like 1902, something like that, you said? Certainly yeah. before 1905, yes. right, Chuck? So, uh, well, I, let, me, let me get the exact date. 1905 is the point I always use because I know that's when the census data was taken. And, and okay, I'm really well, I was just... I was curious if, um, so when they were completed and kind of before the Grand Concourse was open, were these, was this really kind of a new isolated development compared to like everything surrounding it? Was it, and then are there any great photos that show this new neighborhood, this new development kind of being constructed and showing it kind of in isolation? So I can answer some of those questions, right? So the district has about 30 buildings. Mm -hmm. Most of the two family homes, I'm sorry, um, yeah, were built in 1901, and sort of between 1901 and 1905 with two or three other homes, larger apartment buildings built in, in, in one single family home built in 1909 and 1910. Um, I do know at the time from generally photos of the area, what you're describing is true, okay. right? So what would happen in that time is that, and, and this was actually the first time this happened in the United States, and you see this all over the United States today, right, is that the Morris family, I think, de, uh, moved largely to like Newport, Long Island, in part, or Rhode Island, in part because of trains and transit and access um, to the city, to that area. And so they started to sell off their estate and subdivide it into lots, right? And these lots were, you know, about a block long, like what you have with Clay Avenue. And so you had the developer, Ernest um, Wingman, who actually bought the Clay Avenue block to develop it as the number of homes that it is. Um, I don't know whether or not other blocks around it were developed first. I will say that I suspect that they weren't. And the reason why is because around Clay Avenue, and part of the reason why it's special is because it's one and two family, it's, two, it's largely two family homes. If you look on the blocks around Clay Avenue, you see a lot of much larger new law tenements, which is sort of indicative of, I think the, the, law, the new law for tenements, it just, just as a background for some people, um, it's the 1901 Tenement Housing Act, um, and it required for ventilation in every bathroom and generally light in every bedroom. And if you live in the Bronx today, you'll see that most of our homes are actually new law tenements that have rooms of certain sizes with closets, with lights, 
Um, you know, the bathroom generally isn't like a retrofit from the kitchen, right? So, and all of that to be said, you know, surrounding Clay Avenue, you see a lot of new law tenements, which leads me to believe that Clay Avenue predated a lot of the area around. Um, so I think the hunt should probably be on to see if you could find um, some photos of just Clay Avenue um, right. with a de perhaps with a half demolished race course near it. Um, um, exactly. With and, nothing around. And yeah, I, Susan, I like looked, I was digging a lot for when I was with the Historic Districts Council to find like earlier photos. And, you know, I was, you know, was doing, this wasn't like my full time work. So I probably, if I had like a 40 hour week of research, I'm sure I probably could have accessed more things. But, you know, I, I think like a lot of parts of the city, um, there's sometimes just a scarcity of of information on um, its development or photographic documentation of it. I think I was able to find a few mentions of uh, things in, in historic newspapers that were accessible online. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think it's an interesting story because it does just kind of exist as a block of single family houses in an otherwise apartment house uh, dominated neighborhood. But, you know, I think that's a story that could be told. Great, thank you. Yeah. So one other thing is we do not have a good sense at this point of how this block became designated. Now, obviously, Andrew Dolcart, a very well-known historic preservationist and professor at Columbia, was the one who wrote the designation report. But usually, it's very difficult when you just look at the designation report to figure out who actually did the work to advocate or what political forces operated to get a district designated. Because as many of you know, these things don't just designate themselves. <laughs> there's some actor, there's some movement, there's some at least one city council person or someone who says, this is of interest to me. Now, there, you know, just as an example of that, with the Longwood um, district in the Bronx, um, you had, we have something on our NIPAP website that I'll post in the chat shortly, but in that case, Tom Bess, who was the, one of the chief sort of neighborhood activists involved there, recounted that it was really Kent Barwick, who happened to be the chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission at the time, who said, we know there's a lot of activity here, we think that you should push for a district, and they did, and it happened. So there was at least some shred of evidence for why the district got designated. Thus far, unless Paul or Chuck or Susan or Mary Kay or anyone else on this call has, has discovered, I don't know what that was with respect to the Clay Avenue district. So if anyone does have any leads or knows anyone who might know, please let us know because we're always looking to expand the recorded history of preservation in the city. Yeah, yeah, to Brad's point, we're exploring the history, like NIPAP's goal is to preserve the history of preservation. Um, what we do know from Clay Avenue was just a simple note from the Landmarks Report, which was that um, there were two meetings and many residents showed up and they were supportive. One resident, in fact, wanted an expansion to the district beyond just one block. Um, and, you know, there was, I think, one person who um, proposed that, oh, I think there was um, one speaker who was opposed. Um, and it was duly adopted in, I believe the hearings were in 1992, and it was adopted uh, the year thereafter. Now, um, if there is anyone on the line who does know um, or was a part of the, of the designation, uh, uh, feel free to let us know uh, in the chat, and I'm happy to unmute you. Or I actually you unmute yourself and speak. So I'm, I'm looking at the chat a little bit uh, and want to clarify a few things. Brad, there's a ask for um, uh, the single family house. And I definitely think you should show that one because it's okay. the building in the district, I think. Okay. Um, one moment, let me pull that back up. Fifth Street, uh, and I can give a little back to it. Um, and then there was a question, Andrew Dolcart was the professor at Columbia that mm -hmm. also was on the designation, did the designation report. Um, so, Chuck, are you able to see the designation I report that I pulled I up? I can see the designation report, yeah. Okay. And now, do you uh, all in the photos? So actually, let's just stop here while we're, we're while we're on our way. 
give you a sense of the district. So here's East 166th Street in the Bronx. And the district we're talking about, as you can see, is really these 28 buildings, 28 lots, along Clay Avenue up to East 165th Street. So Chuck, if I'm not mistaken, this this lot here. Those, so those are apartment buildings. Um, and on East 165th Street, which is interesting, like I can remember walking up to it the first time and, and coming from the south on, I think the right side, if you're looking at it, so the, the east side, that's the, um, the, the, the mansion or the house. That mm -hmm. um, and, and as you can see, Susan Hopper, this answers one of your questions, which is what was the date of designation? So you can see here it was April 5th of 1994. All right, so let's continue down through here. And here we go. Voila, what do we have? This is an image of that trotting course that Paul had talked about, a horse racing venue that originally occupied the land here. Um, well, originally, of course, it was a, a gigantic glacier and then the land of indigenous peoples who occupied what is now the Bronx, and then the Dutch, and then on, as Paul mentioned, sort of the rest of that history of transition from a pastoral Bronx to an urban Bronx. Okay, and Chuck, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna scroll on through to get us to yeah. some of the individual images within the report because Hopefully that will include the single family home that you mentioned. Sorry for the long scroll. Apparently they took their time with this one. This is Andrew Dolcart, so it's very thorough. I'm I'm not surprised. <laughs> I, I I wish there he was go. on here right yeah. now to correct me if I said anything wrong. Um so yeah, this these are some of the single family houses. Mm -hmm. Uh and this is, you know, it was taken twenty, I guess twenty-six years ago. So uh, and and I think the block is real, you know, relatively intact. I know we have residents or uh, property owners there, but each building is in different states of repair. So they're ranging from you know basic you know gutting from a fire to like most detailing intact. So it's right. it's kind of cool to see the different treatments applied to a building and how how they stand the test of time. Right. I'm going to stop that just because it's sideways, and I'm probably putting a crick in everyone's neck, sorry about that. Let's, uh, let's go to some of these other questions here. Um, Jody Shapiro, if you want to unmute yourself and um, make the note that you noted, that would be wonderful. Uh, sure, hello. Um, I, I just wanted to say that because there is, there is a rail station there uh, with Melrose, um, because of the New York and Harlem Railway, which was the the first railway in New York. Um, there's probably some images that are in the New York Transit Museum archive of that. Um, I couldn't tell you for sure because we're closed to the public right now. Um, full <laughs> disclosure, I work there. Um, I, I, I hope I'm not crashing your little party here, but- um, Absolutely not. We need more the merrier. I, I am developing an ex exhibition about the Bronx right now. Oh. Um, and this was definitely one of the things that popped up on my radar um, because there's this and there's the Bertine Block District also um, and Longwood and some other places that I was intrigued by because some of them are very close to transportation and some of them are not. And I'm trying to kind of piece together through my, through my field of expertise, like why these things popped up where they did why certain things are the way they are in the Bronx uh, because of transit or because of lack of transit. So this is fascinating to me, um, which is, so yeah, I just wanted to say transportation is a real key to a lot of this type of development. Um, I did a similar s study for Queens. Okay. Uh, and there was a show, uh, uh, there was a show two years ago about the seven train and how the IRT flushing line when it was built basically opened up Queens to the rest of the New York area. Um, it was served by rail before, like steam rail, but it was rapid transit that opened everything up. Right, right. And actually, there's a, a tremendous uh, transit story here, right? So it's the Third Avenue Elevated, 
right, of which, of course, you know of. Uh, Third Avenue Elevated was actually the first real sort of like subway line. It was obviously elevated above ground in the Bronx, much like if you live in the Bronx, the Jerome Avenue line is today. Um, and many of you, and some of you may remember it. Um, it was built in like the 1880s to the 1890s. And I could be corrected if I'm wrong, but I believe that's what I read. Um, and it really motivated the development of this area um, as a sort of middle to high middle income district. Um, unfortunately, uh, the city chose to discontinue the Third Avenue elevated in, I believe it was 1973 or around there. Yep. Um, it used to run actually, the Third Avenue elevated actually used to run down Third Avenue in the Bronx and then down Third Avenue in Manhattan and up uh, Third Avenue and up Second Avenue in Manhattan. It was supposed to be replaced by the Second Avenue subway. Of course, we are just getting parts of that today. <laughs> um, but when they discontinued the Third Avenue elevated in the Bronx, um, it really cost, caused a lot of strain to this area because it removed vital transit access. Um, so eventually they obviously discontinued and dismantled the Third Avenue elevated, which leaves you with these situations where you might have a very nice neighborhood such as Clay Avenue that seems fairly remote to transit because the Grand Concourse line is probably about a half a mile away. So it leaves one in the modern era to wonder, why would you build here when there is actually a very interesting and rich transit story there, albeit probably a bit sad. And it also probably contributes a little bit to the uh, investment and disinvestment in the area because the city sort of turned its back transit wise, which was the point of living here in part in the first place um, on the area. And that's definitely one of the things that this exhibit is going to explore um, because it is, it's a big, transit is a big reason why uh, certain neighborhoods flourish and decline when it's taken away. Um, and I agree with you on the Third Avenue Elevated that its closure was a huge loss and you know one that I don't think will ever be recovered from um, unless they build another subway line through the Bronx, which is probably not going to happen. Um, I agree. Because yeah. you just can't build another subway line right now. It's just, you know, digging underground, there's so much stuff there. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for a few more questions here. One that I noted, um, Cindy, would you like to unmute yourself? Cindy Ladopoulos, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, thank you. My question is, did or any noted celebrities had lived there, which would of course be another reason making it, besides it's beautiful, a historic district. I, I haven't been able to find any. When I look through the report, um, I, I, I get the vibe that it was more, you know, this is, a, middle, middle. this is a snapshot of, of sort of New yeah. York life rather than any prominent celebrity. From I mean, I not that somebody could have been, couldn't have been like raised there or something, but I don't even, I, I that's a good point though, because I, I do agree that, you know, that's a big reason for, you know, recognizing the import. There we go. That's the single family house that, <laughs> I, if you look at Brad's screen, that's the, the one single family house that's, it's so cool uh, with the ivy on it. Probably not the best for the building, but, um, uh, yeah, so uh, it, it really was just more of a run-of-the-mill thing, but I do agree that that might have prompted, that's definitely prompted um, attention to be put at other, like, you know, buildings that might have otherwise been overlooked, but here it doesn't seem like there was anybody um, that at least I would have recognized, um, or even, like, historically that was recognized at the time. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. All right, do we have any other questions from anyone out there? And if not, I'm putting a link in the chat right now. So if you enjoyed the program this evening, feel free to leave a tip. Um, we have a bunch of up upcoming programs and I hope you'll join us for some of them. We have an oral history training. So if you want to learn how you could conduct an oral history from your home, even during the lockdown with someone else out there and capture some of these stories, um, you can join us on Monday evening at 6 uh, o'clock p.m., my apologies, um, and feel free to ask for the code at the address I'm typing in the chat right now, info at nipap.org, and I'll just put 6 p.m. oral history training Monday, 
the 18th. Is that right? Yes. And we also have our next Nipe Happy Hour is next week, Friday, and it will be a really interesting discussion with two people, one from the Historic, uh, Historic House Trust and one from the Morris Jumel Mansion, which is in Upper Manhattan. And they will be talking about how they reinterpreted that historic site to reflect new research and new archival understandings of what that historic site was actually all about. So it should be quite interesting. Um, and actually next Wednesday, we have a jam-packed schedule. Next Wednesday, we have a coffee break chat in the afternoon where we'll be talking about a, a giant of New York preservation, a guy named Clay Lancaster. And we'll have Tony Wood from the Archive Project and the, the famous Otis Pratt Pearsall talking about someone he actually met and worked with back in the late 1950s. So a real time capsule being opened. So I, I want to thank everyone for joining this, e this evening and I hope you get out there and clap at seven o'clock. Um, and I hope you're doing well. Enjoy the good weather this weekend. And again, thank you so much. And thanks to our speakers. I will, if, if Paul, if you want to unmute everyone now, in case they have a, an inclination to clap. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ali and Mary Kay, for your great inputs tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Thanks for coming, Dondi. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. See you soon. All thank right. you for coming. Ciao. Thanks, Take Mom. Ben. Oh, hi, Ben. Hi, Mel. <laughs> Ray, I'm glad you were able to join us. Yeah, just made it. It's, uh, it's good. All the best. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Chuck, who's Patu? What's that? Hi. Hi, Patu. Oh. I don't know who that is. No. Oh, it's Lee. Oh, I thought. Mm -mm. I'm sorry, I thought it was Mel. No. No, no, Mel was the um, image of a, a, a woman singing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, but, uh, no, I got my mom to join, so she was just calling me. Yes. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, good work. Yeah. Are you guys in separate rooms? Good job, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure. Um, I wasn't sure if Andrew Dolcar was going to surprise us, Brad. I was hoping. <laughs> Did you tell him? Yes. But I, I feel like everyone these days, it's like whether an email actually gets through to someone's brain <laughs> is, is quite the assumption and leap to make. So. Yeah. Well, there, are, there was like a full year of him emailing me about this like National Register nomination that I wasn't doing. So, mm. you know, yeah. I... I if he ignores an email regarding me, it's like probably karma, I guess. <laughs> ben, what's new? Oh, you know, just, uh, you know, winding down a long week here. Hey, I man. A hey, hey, man. I don't feel any less tired not going to an office. <laughs> I feel way, way more tired not going to an office. I agree. I think this is like, this is just meeting fatigue. <laughs> We had to have a whole conversation because people were like, uh, yeah, my friends at law firms have like instituted mandatory, like no meetings on Fridays because we can't do any work. Like, this is ridiculous. We're all just like wall to wall all day long. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel really lucky because NIPAP is such a tiny little organization and there's like a little bit of latitude to sort of work things out. But I'm trying to picture myself being a lawyer like I used to be and doing what I did, but from home, like with unceasingly with no break between life and work at all. Mm -hmm. And it would, it sounds horrific. <laughs> I cannot imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And especially then you talk to people who have kids or infants and it's like, Oh boy, this sounds like mental health disaster, like imminently about to happen. Although it's like weirdly become socially acceptable in a good way 
that like your children are screaming in the background or like are on your lap, like on a business call. And well, people are yeah, talking. I mean, like, and I also brought my child to the whole meeting today. But yeah, I mean, but he does not care. He's like, <laughs> what is history? What is the meaning of life? I don't care. I'm pass out. So, you know, but you know what I mean? It's that people are just like, deal with it. I got kids and I'm stuck at home. Like, there's no way out of this. Oh, <laughs> like, Paul. Un unprofessional be damned. Paul, you can stop the recording. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs>